And our scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 22. And it says, From that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Please welcome Pastor George Saloom as he brings us around the word. Uh, brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, guys. Can we just remain standing for a moment? I, I know we like to sit down. I know we were standing for a moment. But just for a moment, I want us to raise our hands. I just want a moment in worship with the Lord. I just feel to um, minister to some people here today. Let's just raise our hands. Father, I thank you right now, my God. If you feel comfortable to do so, raise your hand. Father, I thank you that as we come, we submit our lives to you each and every day. Today is no different. You are our God. You are our King. You are our Lord and you are our Saviour. You are our master. We are your servants, my God. So many people don't know that whether we like it or not, we serve something in our lives. We choose to serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We don't serve our desires. We don't serve our affiliations. We don't serve work or money, but we serve you, my God, for you're our King. And Father, above all else, we thank you for your grace. The grace that enables us the grace that gives us the ability and the favour to do and be what You've called us to be. And Father, I thank You, my God, that as we incline our ear to You today, that You will speak to us individually and uniquely as You've ordained and purpose for this day, the 30th of June, 2019, this moment, as ordained by You, my God. And I thank You for that, Jesus. Let's stay in this moment of worship. Matanya, just over here. Hello, young lady. I have a word for you just during worship. I just felt, I just felt the Lord say to you that there is a, you've been, you've been seeking something from God in particular. There's been this particular thing you've been seeking from the Lord and, and it seems like it's a tiny little thing, like a little seed. You know, if you've ever seen the mustard seed, the mustard tree is massive, but the seed is tiny. It's dark. It's a little dark, little grain, like almost like a grain of sand, but black. And it seems so, almost insignificant if you were to share that very thing you've been seeking from God with someone else. But to God, it's not just the seed. It is a tree. It's not insignificant. It's massive. And God's saying to you today, continue to seek Him for it. Continue to, to be precious with it. You know, Jesus turned to someone and said uh, about casting pearls before swine. And sometimes we can take the preciousness things of God, talk to other people about it. And they go, oh yeah, and they, they sort of downplay it because they don't understand what it is. They just see the seed, they can't see the tree, but God sees the tree. And He wants you to know that there is coming a moment soon where you're going to see the significance of what, even though you know it's significant, it's going to be greater. The picture that God's going to paint for you is going to be greater than what you see now. And so get ready for that. Continue to seek Him for it. Don't share this with a lot of people who don't know the Lord, okay? And those who don't have your best interest at heart and who aren't connected with God in that spiritual sense because I'll trample on it, okay? And put no value to it when it's very precious. So Father, I pray right now that the Word that You've spoken over Matanya this day, let it be exactly as You've called it to be, designed and purposed in her life, because You are truly our designer and our creator and You have our blueprint in Your mind. Father, let it be according to Your Word, in Jesus' Name, Father, I pray for that over her life. In Jesus' Name, Amen. Now, there are some of us here today who've got some nerve damage in your body. I know there's some in their neck or in their back or in their arms, some nerve damage. Who is that in there over here, nerve damage? Is there a few more? Hands going up everywhere. There's some nerve damage, you're feeling tingling or pain, great. Can I get some people around the ones whose hands are up right now? And we're gonna pray for healing over that nerve damage over their lives. I felt some tingling. Let's pray, Father, we believe that God is a God of healing and a God of power, a God of hope and a God of life. Father, You say in Your Word that we believe so truly that by the stripes that Jesus bared on His body at that cross, that every sickness is healed in the Name of Jesus. Father, let those nerves be healed this moment, this day, this hour. Father, I pray that those nerves start to connect. You're the one that designed us, so You know exactly what needs to happen. Let every cell start to align, that every nerve, bit, bit of nerve damage start to come back together. May God, let every, every if it's being pinched, let it be released. If there's deterioration, let there be restoration. In the Name of Jesus, I pray. Nerve damage, there is healing right now in Jesus' Name. 
Let's continue to stay in that moment right now in Jesus' name. Over that nerve damage right now, Father, let there be healing in Jesus' name right now. Healing. We believe that in Jesus' name. We all said amen and amen. Our God is a good God, yeah? Come on, let's give Him all the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Why don't we grab our seat right now? Thank you, team. Whew, I just want to thank all of the people that are involved in making a Sunday service happen uh, in this house. And for those who pray in the morning, first thing in the morning, to those uh, who set up the cafe, to those who, you know, obviously on the worship team and the production team and those who service, whether it's a communion Sunday or offer, take up their offering and, and uh, those who greet us and those who prepare the car park and, and everything. And I want to thank you all. Uh, let's give them a great big hand and say thank you so much for all that you do every single Sunday. You're up early. And uh, most of us come, arrive to church, enjoy the presence of God and go home and aren't mindful of you. And, and uh, so I just want to acknowledge you and say thank you so much for, for taking the time, investing your time, talents and treasure in this house. Uh, but you know, this is, this is only part of who we are as disciples of Jesus, isn't it? It really is. It's only just a moment. It's, it's something like 1.9% of your week is, is this being, being in a church service. But this is not church. Church is you and I. Church is you and I. The other 90% of our times, 98% of our time is out with people we don't know or out with family and friends who need you to be Jesus to them. And so I, I, uh, I want to acknowledge those as well who, who take that amongst their uh, busyness of life. Many of you here with children running around, sports, training, uh, extracurricular activities, let alone your workload, let alone uh, doing life in general, paying bills, hustling, <laughs> running a business, some of you, all of those things. And for single parents, times that by four, have to go around and do all of that as well. And so, and so I just want to thank you so much for being such great disciples of Jesus in your world. I, I'm hearing testimonies each week and I thank you for writing in and messaging in and, and some of you write through Facebook on Messenger and, and tell me about what God's doing in your life or what's happening in the different situations and I want to thank you for that. Um, you know, some of you have shared with me uh, some family things that you've gone through and, and how you've just believed God over the last couple of years and, and watched God do some miraculous things in your life. Some miraculous things. Things that you thought were impossible six months ago have now become possible. Things that two years ago you didn't even know how to pray for, now you're walking in because you stood with God, walking in the fruit of what you thought was not even, I'm not even how to pray for it two years ago, and now you're walking in the fruit of it. And, uh, but don't forget the Lord in the midst of that. Don't forget what it was like uh, without any moving from God. And, and for those also who are still going right in the midst of it and you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, thank you for being great examples of what to do when you don't have an answer yet. Or even more, what to do when the answer is no. When you've prayed for that healing, when you've prayed for that deliverance, but the answer is no, my grace is sufficient for you. How to respond that way. Isn't that a great verse in the Bible in the New Testament? When Paul says, I prayed three times to the Lord, three times to the Lord, to take this thorn from my flesh away from me, but God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Oh, I love that verse. I really do love that verse. I don't know how many times I've used that, that verse has propped me up. Because Paul in his weakness says, in my weakness, you are strong, God. That in, in, in all of the things that I can't get through in my life, I don't boast about myself because I know I can't do it. I boast in you because I know you can. And so in the midst of that, I want to thank those who are still going through the tough times but still praising Jesus through those moments, amen? Because Jesus is in the midst of that fire with us. I love that song, I oh, really, really. I, every, time I, every time that song comes on now, there is another in the fire instantly. Shadrach, Meshach and uh, Abednego, not Abednego. Us white people have been saying it wrong or you white people have been saying it wrong for a very long time. It's Abednego, all right? Everyone say Abednego. Actually, it's Abednego. You've got to have the to that, right? <laughs> that they were in the fire, that they were thrown in that furnace and in the midst of them, when the king looked down, there is someone walking amongst them that looks like the son of man, the son of God. And they're walking. They're walking around in the fire. But here's the key to this. It's not just the miracle of walking in the fire and not being burnt. The greater miracle is walking out of it, not singed or smelling like fire. 
Why is that a miracle? Because that is tantamount to you walking out of a situation not being bitter, not being jaded, not being, you know, uh, uh, twisted and yuck and walking out with a disability emotionally. That we all go through situations that are horrible. Situations where people have, have cast doubt on you or, or, or ridiculed your name or mocked you uh, or have cheated you or have, or have uh, cheated on you, uh, have taken and stolen. And yet you walk out of that situation with no smell of fire on you. You're not bitter. You're not twisted. Isn't that amazing when God is with you? That even though I walk through the pain, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I will not smell like fire. I will not smell like death. I will not be bitter. I will not be twisted. I will not be jaded. I will walk out because the Son of Man has walked with me in those moments. Amen. The Son of Man. That's the difference between someone who knows the Lord and someone who doesn't know the Lord. That is the difference. How can we talk to people about Jesus if we look and smell like everyone else in the world? If we look and smell like uh, what, a, what a person who doesn't know the Lord looks and smells like, walks out of a situation and jaded and can't see hope and can't see, then how can we attest to the glory and the good news, not the horrible news, the good news of the gospel if we don't carry the good news of the gospel, if we don't walk in the good news of the gospel? Because, you know, people, when they look at us, I know this is really heavy. As soon as you walk, as soon as you open your mouth, it's like, boom, this comes out. Jesus is talking to someone here today. There's no doubt about that. Uh, uh, you know, when, when we walk through those situations, uh, we have to walk out of them with no, with no smell. If, we, if, we, if people, the, the first way that they're going to know Jesus is through you. Most people's first introduction to Christ is through your life. Think about that for a minute. Stop thinking about it for a minute now. About if, if someone encounters me, <laughs> there's, by the way, there's a meme on Facebook that people have been circulating. Talk about memes. Goodness me, they come to church, pastor talks about memes. And, um, and, and there's, this, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a dialogue going between this business owner and Jesus. I don't know if you've seen it. And the business owner says, Jesus, I want to put a fish symbol on my, on my business, on my business logo. And Jesus says, Why? He says, because I want people to know that I'm a Christian. And then Jesus says, why don't, why, why don't we just see if they notice that you're a Christian by the way that you behave, by the, uh, by the way that you treat them, by the honesty that you run in your business and the way that you talk and walk. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Because the gospel that people see will be you and I before they see the actual gospel, as in, as in the, the writing that's, that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They're going to see you and I. People will watch us and they, they will taste you. Oh, by the way, each one of us has a particular taste and a smell. Deodorant won't help. For some, it might. In the natural, but in the spiritual, deodorant's not. There is no, there is no spiritual deodorant or spiritual cologne other than that that comes from the Word of God. Other than that, a lot, than, than that of a life that is washed in the water of the Word. That your fragrance and your taste is what people partake of you and it comes through being in the Word of God and allowing His Spirit to guide you and change you. How do you smell and taste to other people? Whoo, that's a deep question. Let's just stop for a minute. Let's just, let's just, let's just everyone close your eyes. Come on. Close your eyes with me. I want you to think about your encounters this week, this last week. Don't, don't, don't say anything. Think about your encounters from this last week, the encounters of people in the shopping centre, uh, at schools, maybe picking up the kids, other parents, um, your neighbours, your friends, your family. Think about those encounters. And then now think about what did you taste like or smell like to those people? What did it, did it smell a bit? Sharp and jaded? Did you taste a bit sour? Oh yeah, I tasted sour this week. Did you, did you, was there a repugnant smell about you? Were you repelling people or drawing them in? Isn't that interesting? Let's open our eyes. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that when you look at your life that way, it shows something different about you uh, we think of ourselves different because you know what? We react to situations rather than responding. 
As humans, we react rather than respond, more, more so than often. Reactions are so normal to us, they're milliseconds. They take milliseconds to happen. And sometimes you've got to stop and go, why did I react that way? Why did I not respond that a different way? Why did I react this way? There is a psychological reason why I reacted. It, you realise that you did not choose the music that you like. It was chosen for you by your environment, your nurture, what you were exposed to. Possibly the colours and the tastes and the clothing and the... I know we like to think we're individuals and maybe throughout life we change it a little bit, but generally the way that you were brought up, unless there is a huge change on your part, it was shaped in you. That is the same for the way they react. we react. When a young boy who sees his father beating his mother says to himself, I never want to grow up like my dad. When the, when the statistics show us that a large portion of, of young men who grow up in that environment perpetuate that behaviour, even though they said for years, I do not want to grow up like my father. The reason is their focus was on the father the whole time, their father the whole time. The only way that change happens is if, it's, if they focus on what they do want to be like, not what they do not want to be like. And so there is this, there is this way that we react to things and sometimes we've got to stop and go, how do I respond to it? Why did I react this way? Why did I get upset? Why did I feel hurt when someone said this? When someone didn't reply to my text in 4.3 seconds and I took that as a rejection, why is that? <laughs> hey, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why is it when I posted something on Instagram and I didn't get a minute, a like a minute, in 10 minutes I've only got five likes, oh no. Maybe I should post at different times of the day. Why is it that I respond this way to an image on a ludicrous screen that gives me my value as opposed to who I really am? Why is that? Why do I respond these? Well, why do I react this way? These are very important questions because they go to the very heart of who Jesus is to us and how he's created us. It's not coincidence that because technology is, is so quickly changing, you realise that, let's say, in the 1400s to the 1500s, 1400s, let's say, to the 1900s, 500 years, there was very little technological advancements. Very, like, very little. But you come now, just between 2010 and 2019, the ludicrous. You realise what you have in your pocket right now, the mobile phone. It takes photos. I know that's it's like, yeah, so... That's how, used, that's, how, that's how used you are to these things. We're so used to it now. They take 24 megapixel photos. You understand that that can be blown up and put on the side of a building. You realise that, um, that not only does it take photos, but it records high definition video. Only 10 years ago, 12, 12 years ago, we needed big cameras for that. That, that technology didn't even exist. Um, not only that, that phone in your hand is more powerful than the computer equipment that NASA used to launch people to the moon in 1969. I know, it's ludicrous, I know. That little phone <laughs> has got stuff in it that we did not even knew existed 15 years ago, like Face ID. You and I are like, ah, we get our phones out, ah, Face ID, it's not quick enough. This is what we like these days. Oh, it's not quick enough. Oh, oh. Hurry up. It's taking more than 0.4 milliseconds to open up my phone. I mean, three years ago, you had to put in a code. Before then, your phone wasn't even locked. I mean, do you understand where we're going as society? And because of these things, it's not, it's not a coincidence that the things that have skyrocketed in regards to popularity are things like searching, search um, websites like Google, Instagram where it's about image and self-worth. Searching is because we're looking for something constantly, we're searching. We're designed to be searching, why? Because there is a, there is a need in us emotionally, psychologically, spiritually to be looking for who we really are. The big questions of society cannot be answered by science, they can only be answered by a, a world view, a, ph a philosophy. The big questions that you've heard me talk about, uh, 
Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Origin, where do they come from? Meaning, what's the whole reason that I'm here? Morality, what's the difference between right and wrong? And destiny, where do I go after I die? These questions are the big four questions of society. Every culture, every society asks these questions. And they can only be answered by a world view. That science can't answer these questions. And, and any, any scientist who, who says that is deluding themselves and whoever they're talking to. And by the way, science proves God. Let me just tell you that. Um, in August of this year, in August, in a couple of months' time, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be doing, uh, our services are going to be changed a little bit, um, where I'm going to be doing uh, apologetic topics, but it's going to be a Q&A session in the service. So what that means is I'm going to present a particular topic, like uh, one of the topics, or one of the overarching umbrella topics uh, will be, can you prove God outside of the Bible? Um, the other, you know, using whether it's philosophy or morality and things like that. Uh, other topics are, why is there, for instance, why is there such an eternal, eternal consequence for a temporal mistake? Um, and different things like that, okay? So I'm going to go through those. And then I'll present those topics and then, or I have an Arctic topic each week. And then during that particular week, you can text in live anonymously so you don't have to freak out. Uh, during the service, you can text in questions that I'll answer for about 20, 25 minutes. So during the service, um, that will come up on screen. They'll pop up on screen as you text them in and I'll answer them directly and hopefully I can answer them. <laughs> I'll answer them. It's okay. I'll try my best to answer them. And anything I can't answer, I'll research and then put, a, put it on a video during the week and, and post it up to our, our Facebook page. But I want to do that because I want to give people answers to questions that they get asked at the water cooler at work, by neighbours, by friends, even questions that they have themselves. And, and so, um, because we're constantly searching and we're yearning. So that's August. And by the way, July next month, um, we're going to do church service a little bit different, so make sure, um, you know, I'm going to, yeah, it's going to be different anyway for July. Uh, I'm going to do churches differently. Just going to turn it up on its head a little bit. Is that okay? In July, just change it a little bit, um, you know, just because I want to. <laughs> just to make it a little different, it's all right. Is that okay with everyone? Yeah. I know we all like to sit in the same seat in the same section, come to the same service, and, you know, and you feel comfortable. Oh, if I get there by 9.45, it's the third song, so I'll know I'll make it, I'll be okay. Next week, you'll miss the message. <laughs> and then in September, uh, so that's July, then August, and then September uh, is going to be the message about end times. And so, uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, the four or five future events of the, uh, of the end times when Jesus comes back and is fully revealed to the world of who he is, his second coming that we speak about. And so that's going to be a great, great um, next couple of months. But today, as Jared, actually, you know what I'd love to do? Is Liz Howland here? I know she's here, so I know she might be. Oh, there she is, Liz. Liz is our, our one of our great homegrown missions, uh, uh, great people in this house. And Liz goes, um, Liz goes around to the outback and loves the loves the farmers when the droughts are happening and they're still happening in some areas. She's out there uh, taking her caravan, or now she's she's getting one, but in her in her four wheel drive, which by the way was a blessing. You had a broken down, beat up car, believe for a, a four-wheel drive. Now you've got a Prado that, that, that the Lord has blessed you with. Isn't that incredible? And so uh, she goes away for a few months. Uh, this is her last Sunday with us for a few months. So can we just pray for her right now, uh, to, for Liz and, and her to going on this missions uh, trip around the outback. Father, we thank you. You see your daughter. You see the work that she has done over the years into those families and those individuals in the outback of our nation the salt of this earth, these people. We thank you, my God, that as she goes, that she takes your love, both spiritually and practically, to those families and those individuals. That she, when she goes there, she is like refreshing water because you are. She is like a breath of fresh air because you are God. Go before her, my God, remove any obstacles. Let doors be open that need to be open. Let it get in front of people that you have ordained for her to be in front of, Father. Let towns be open. Let opportunities be open. And let hope be showered over each one of those families. Through your name we pray. Keep her safe. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Liz, for all that you do. You're wonderful. Well, as, as Jeremy read a moment ago, um, don't you love Jesus? Like, honestly, don't you love Jesus? You know, let's not forget who Jesus is in our, in our lives and what he's done for us. I just, ah. But let me, let me get back to this. Uh, Aaron, thank you so much for your word last week, mate. That was fantastic, skillful and expectant. It's so true. 
Thank you so much for your word, mate. I really appreciate you waiting on the Lord and, and, and speaking that. A, a couple of weeks ago, I started preaching from Matthew 16 in regards to a message called the, Rocks, uh, the Rock, the Keys and the Gates about Jesus being revealed by Peter. Who do you think I am? And he says, you are the son of the, son of the living God. You are the Christ. And he says, wow, my father has revealed this to you, not flesh and blood. My father has told you this. And, uh, and there's a celebration of finding out who Jesus is. And, and then he goes and he says that I will build my church, Jesus saying, and, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. heaven. Jesus saying that you've got to stand and bind things, or forbid things from happening in your life. And you've got to loose things as in permit things from, to happen in your life. And, and sometimes it's our words that cause these things to happen when they shouldn't be. Oh, how are you? Oh, my life is horrible and things aren't going right and, and everything never goes right. I never have good luck and I never have good near and I, nothing good happens to me and I never win any competitions and I never and I never and my husband's annoying and my wife's a nag and my children are frustrating and, and, and when you repeat these things over and over, what do you think you're going to walk in two, three, four, five years from now? Everything you're saying. That's what you're going to live in. But through the confession and the power of our tongue. This is why Paul says that he, a man who can control his tongue, is perfect. Whew. What a statement. There is life and death in the power of the tongue. And the more we speak, the more we speak death, the more we walk into it. The more we speak negativity, the more our life becomes negative. Clinical psychologists now tell us, they're only just catching up with this, catching up with this very thing, that the more we speak negative thoughts, the more it rewires our brains. Neuroscientists are telling us this too. The more we re we're rewiring our brains enough that our brain structure actually changes and becomes more negative in its stance so that your glasses go from being positive and you put on negative glasses and we see everything's tainted through a negative light. But God never ordained us for, to be that way. This is what happened in the garden, right? This is, this is one of the questions I'll answer in a few weeks time, but this is what happened in the garden. We went from just trusting who God is, being created in His image and trusting Him to tell us the difference between right and wrong to us now saying, no, 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 we want to be able to reason the, the knowledge of good and evil. We want to dictate what's good and what's evil. And the further, we, the further away as humanity we get away from our creator and our designer, the further away we get, the less we are knowledgeable and know. Now we are confused about gender. Now we are confused about identity. Now as a society, it's not, it's not shocking that we're going this way. Now, I heard today that, um, that we, 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 the way that we think it is starting to become skewed where an owner of a, of a baseball team or, or a team over in America, uh, the, 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 the board now is saying, no, 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 we don't want to say a base basketball team. We don't want to call the owner of the team an owner anymore because most of the team are African-American and that harkens back to the slavery days. We want to call them a governor. I mean, what, what just happened? How does the word owner of a business have any hearkening back to something that was horrible in the time of, of that nation. It's just this, this, this weird treading upon political correctness that's causing us to be stupid. Yeah. It's causing us to do silly things that five years ago was, yeah, we all understood what this meant. Now let's change terms because we're losing identity. We're losing what we're really designed to be as humans. We, we're losing that as a society. I still am surprised at how for people, not, not all people, but some people who don't believe in a God nor Jesus nor think the book, this book is a ridiculous book, don't believe in heaven and hell, can be offended by something that someone says, a sports person says on his own Instagram that you don't even follow. You don't follow the guy. You read something he, he wrote, you get offended at something you don't believe. It's like me saying, Adrian... The, if you don't believe in unicorns, one's going to come at night and stab you with its horn. <laughs> and then you get offended at that. Oh my goodness, I don't believe in unicorns, but you, you cause death to come to me from this unicorn that I don't believe in. <laughs> what? 
And so we, we have this ideology and, and what does the media do, right? Because you've got to be careful with the media. The media is, woo, lost it the most. But the media, it, what do they do? We, they hearken on one word. There are 10 words he spoke there, one of them. Let's go to the homosexual one because that's the biggest red flag. That's the biggest button. See, Christians hate homosexuals. No, they don't. And any Christian who hates homosexuals doesn't know the, know the love and the care of God. Please understand that. Please, please know that God is a loving and caring God. Otherwise, He wouldn't have sent His Son to die for us. And anyone who judges someone because they're homosexual forgets what they were before they knew Jesus. You realise that, 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 what that what that spoke to, um, uh, that Scripture that He put up, or any Scripture like that, is not trying to bring condemnation. It's actually trying to bring conviction in order to, for there to be change through the love and the power and the grace of Jesus Christ. It's not for us to speak in condemnation. Please know this. And so, so we live in this world where identity started to wane a little bit. And now we're all scared. Like we're all scared. We're even all scared to talk about plastic straws. <laughs> like we're scared to talk about them. Yesterday I went to the movies and I got a straw. It was those paper straws. Seriously, come on guys. We can put people on the moon and put a phone in my, in my pocket that literally can burn a hole in my butt because of the radiation. But we can't make straws other than paper ones. Really? Can someone create something that is not so dissolvable? And I got this straw and I put it in my Coke and I'm drinking from the Coke and 10 minutes later, it's dissolved on top and frayed. It's dissolved down the bottom. The whole thing is stinking and bad. And I'm like, Ugh, I don't want to drink my drink anymore. So I had to get up out of the movie and I walked back over and I went to go get another couple of straws for me and my wife. And, and we got the, and the lady goes, oh, didn't you get a straw? I said, yeah, but it's all tattered. She goes, I oh, know, I hate these paper straws. But you know, you know, you know, we've got to save the environment. Just in case I was going to become greeny on her, right? Uh, and she, I said, <laughs> uh, don't get me started. I'm just going to go back and watch my movie. If we really cared about the environment, we wouldn't have movies. Hollywood wouldn't exist. Think about it for a minute. All of us, all the young people who care about the environment are on their screens sucking up electricity every moment of every day. <laughs> None of them ride to, work, uh, to school or walk. They're all in their massive four-wheel drives being taken to school. <laughs> but you know, the straw is going to destroy the environment. No one tells... Oh, forget it. Anyway, let's just carry on. This is becoming political now. <laughs> let's just... And by the way, I love the environment. The Lord asks us to look after it. So a Christian should be the greatest environmentalist, not a stupid one. Okay, we're, we're the biggest tree huggers, but not, a, not above people. Anyway, let's carry on. I'm not going to make it religious. Where am I up to? I know where I'm up to. Let's go to the scripture that, that Jordan read a moment ago. In Matthew 16, 21. This is what Jesus says. He, he goes on and, he, and it says that, you know, Jesus is now telling them after he's been revealed who he is, that he's going to suffer some things and die. And uh, it's just part of what needs to happen in his life. That's what he's come to, on the earth to do. But Peter takes him aside and begins rebuking him. Peter takes him aside. Oh, so respectful of you, Peter. That he grabs Jesus, pulls him away from the crowd. Hey, you boys, disciples, you stay there. Pulls him away. And now he's going to rebuke Jesus. So I want to disrespect you, but I don't want to do it in front of everyone. Okay, so that's okay. So that's cool. That's cool. That's cool. Let's pull them aside. All right, that's not too bad so far, Peter. And then he says to him, listen to the words. He says, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. In other words, uh, this is not going to happen on my watch, mate, because, you know, I'm Peter. I've got a big mouth and a, and a knife. This is not going to happen to you, Jesus, not on my watch. So really, was Peter really concerned with Jesus or was he concerned with himself, with the image? Or was he really concerned that Jesus was going to be hurt or, or was he concerned about what it's going to look like if, if someone, burly-chested Peter, couldn't protect this man of God? 
And Peter pulls him aside and says, far be it from you. But what's more important is the particular wording that he uses. Far be it from you is like you and I saying now, God forbid. God forbid that this happens to you, Lord. So here is Peter invoking God's name for something that God had ordained to happen. <laughs> Let me say that again so it settles in a little bit. Here is Peter saying, let God not cause this to happen about something that God specifically sent Jesus on the planet to do. Isn't it interesting that we can do that sometimes with God ourselves? We can stand before God because we're in a situation and go, God, stop this from happening. Let it not happen to me. I don't want to be in this situation. And God goes, nah. God, we, we go to other people and say, you know what? This should not be happening to you. And God's going, what do you know? You don't see the thread that I'm taking this person on this journey that I'm allowing this person to go through. That does not mean every bad thing that happens to you. I'm talking good things too. It doesn't mean, we don't say, sometimes we can do this. We can, we can basket God, right? We can go, good things in my life, God. Bad things in my life, not God. God doesn't send bad things, but He allows us to go through trials and tribulations. He allows us to go through things because it shapes our culture, uh, sorry, our character. It shapes who we are as people. Because what, what, is, what is God's ultimate goal for humanity? To be in a relationship with them so that they can be all that He's created us to be into eternity. And so we've got to be shaped. Unfortunately, I'd love it if it was easier than going through trials. It would be awesome if we can just walk into a machine. Hmm, I'd like good character. Click, walk out. Woo! That would be wonderful. But it's not like that. It's not the matrix. It's not something you can just... And then you walk out and you're like, oh, I know jujitsu. It's not how it works. <laughs> you want to know jujitsu, you've got to put in the hard work. You want to have a good character, you've got to go through trials. You've got to go through situations. You've got to go through moments. You've got to go through life. This is what life is. Life is like going through one, one horrible moment to another horrible moment with enjoyable moments in between. Are we all encouraged? <laughs> in Jesus. There's a saying, life happens. We understand, life happens, things happen. And so it's in those moments that characters develop them. And, and, but, but, but what we do is we want to say, God, pull me out of this. And God's going, come on, hang in there. I'm shaping you for something into the future. Like when I went to university, I gave my life to God at 18 and I went to uni and I'm thinking, God, yeah, whoa, I'm in uni. Yeah, I got into do a bachelor, bachelor degree of economics and majoring in corporate law and accounting. Whoa! And then six months in, I'm like, I don't want to do this. I want to go serve the Lord. I want to go serve the Lord. Mm, hallelujah. Because serving the Lord is more spiritual than doing university. Mm. Thank God I had a youth pastor who smacked me over the head and said, wake up to yourself. You've got to finish. If you want to honor God, you've got to finish what you started. I said, okay, okay, okay. Now, what I didn't realize is that 20 years later, God used the same skills that I had to learn while I was at university in that four-year degree of researching and understanding and developing arguments and, and, and knowing how to, how to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with someone about, uh, circa, about issues and things that I believe and values. And, and, and that is the very thing I use to today. That was the foundation of what got me the ability to stand with, with corporate leaders and be able to talk to them about the things of God. Um, last Thursday, two Thursdays ago, I was in Sydney with my business partner uh, for a night. We went to go meet with um, some, a company, a large company called Coverforce, uh, who we become, uh, have a joint venture with here in, in Brisbane. They wanted to break into the Brisbane market, asked us to come on board. I thought it was a joke when we met with them. I thought, why would this $350 million turnover company want to go with this little Arab bloke on the side, right? Like, why would they want to join with us, an Arab and an African? Like, there's a joke in there somewhere, right? And so... Um, <laughs> And so we, you know, so, but it was true. They sent the contract up to us last November. I was like, what? These guys are for real, Adrian. These guys are real. I read this contract, like 48 page contract. Took me six weeks to read it. Anyway, so um, <laughs> use lawyer people, use lawyers. Trust me, it's much better. And, um, and so we, we went through the motion, did the whole thing, got into, and it's gone exactly as they promised. And, and so we're down with them having a celebration lunch that it's all come through and it's wonderful. And I'm sitting at a table with the CEO slash major shareholder of this company, uh, which is now, when we, when we went to go meet with them, was a $350, $280 million company. Now it's an $870 million company because they decided to buy half of another big insurance company. And, um, and, now, they're, and now he's sitting there in front of me and we're talking and chatting. And, and, he's, and he offers, he says, hey, George, you know, have you ever thought about buying companies in your industry? 
I said, oh yeah, we thought about it as a growth prospect. Yeah, we thought about it. He goes, well, awesome. We'd love to bankroll you. What? Well, I laughed. I actually laughed. I went, <laughs> thanks, Jim. <laughs> he goes, no, 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 I'm being serious. We're happy to go in percentage with you because we can see something over you guys and the way that you conduct business. And so we're happy to bankroll you to buy other companies in your industry so you can grow that way. What? What, what do you mean? You want to give us money? Yeah. Now, Lovely conversation, but a better conversation happened about an hour later. We get up to go, and uh, he, he comes over with me, and, um, and he says to me, he, him and his general manager uh, are talking to me while the bill's being paid, um, and the general manager says to me, do you know Rod Smith in Sydney? I said, no, I said, I know the name. He goes, he's the guy that recommended you guys, which is why we came and approached you last year. I said, oh, okay, that's interesting. I said, no, I don't know him. He goes, um, he's a Christian guy, he's a Pentecostal. I said, oh, really? He goes, yeah, he said he knows you. He says you're a preacher. <laughs> did, did you have to say that in front of the CEO? But okay. And then he says, he says, are you a preacher? <laughs> I said, yeah, I am actually. I actually am um, I'm, I'm a, a leader of a church in, in a, a suburb called Karina in Brisbane. And then the CEO goes, What? I said, yeah, yeah, I, I lead a church. And he goes, hang on, you got this business and you also lead a church? I said, yeah. Wow. And then, then the general manager says to me, um, hey, well, when we're in Brisbane, can we come watch you perform one Sunday? <laughs> <laughs> I said, sure. I said, I actually pre preach more than I perform. But anyway, yeah. You can, some people call it a performance. But anyway, yeah, you can, you can come on a Sunday. That would be awesome. And the CEO says, oh, okay, I'd like to see that. I said, yeah, sure, not a problem. That'd be great. And then, he, um, and then the CEO asks me, he goes, so how long have you been doing this? I said, oh, man, I've known the Lord probably for about 25 years now, 26 years. Um, you know, I gave my life to God. I was 18 years old. And in the midst of this restaurant, in the middle of Barangaroo, which is a business centre of Sydney, I'm talking to an $870 million CEO about what Jesus has done for me, not because I tried, not because I was looking for it, not because of, of anything that was my situation, but I was ready when the situation arose and the doors opened by another guy who doesn't know the Lord, opens the door. Now I'm talking to the CEO about what Jesus has done for me. And he kept asking me questions about why would you do that? You seem like an intelligent guy. <laughs> this is very interesting to me. Uh, I may be up in the middle of August. Can I come and see you? <laughs> That was a lot better than let's buy companies together. As wonderful as that was, to be able to talk to this man who was in his 60s about the things of God and what, how God has changed my life was incredible. Now, you can't plan that, you can't, but you can, you can expect that. You can say, God, I'm going to be ready for you. Now, as, and I'm being honest with you, when he said, are you a preacher to me, the general manager, I'm thinking, oh no, what's the CEO going to think? And then when I, but then I felt the presence of God. I felt like, no, 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 what are you talking about? This is who you are. Yeah, this is who I am. And so when he asked the question, are you really a preacher? Yeah. What does that mean? And we got talking. By the end of that conversation, which took, it was only about a five minute conversation while the bill was being paid and we're walking out. The, um, the CEO said to me, he said, mate, I'm, um, I've got a, I've, I, thought I, I thought I had a respect for you before, but now I've got a, a deeper respect for you. I said, really? Thanks, Jim. I really appreciate that. He goes, no, no, I'm serious. I really am. Um, and I will email you and let you know when we're up here. And so how you did email me the next day and told me that they're going to be up here in the first week of August. And so um, if you see an older gentleman walking in with me, be nice to him, yeah? <laughs> Lovely. You guys are, I'm joking. You guys are nice to everyone. But it's in those moments, it's in those moments where we don't have to think about God, what, why am I here? Stop me from doing this. Let, let, let this embarrassing moment just pass to God. You take control of it. You make it happen as you need to. And then, so Peter, Peter says this stuff to, to Jesus and he just, he just blurts things out, right? But the more interesting to me is how, how Jesus responds to him. Verse 23, it says, But he, Jesus, turned and said to Peter, let's stop there for a minute. He turned. So, so just, just imagine this. He didn't turn towards Peter because Peter grabbed him and pulled him aside. He's talking to Jesus face to face. 
It says he turned to Peter and said, he turned. So he turned away from Peter. He turned away from Peter. It doesn't say away, it says he turned and said to Peter. What he actually did was Jesus was looking at Peter and then he turned. He turned his back to Peter because his next line was, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offence to me. (laughs) I mean, that's a pretty bad statement. (laughs) I mean, come on, let's be honest. That's a pretty bad statement to get from Jesus. I mean, come on, seriously. I think out of everything that Jesus said to anyone, even when he said to the Samaritan woman, (laughs) the dogs aren't worthy to be fed. The dogs don't get fed before the, 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 the master of the house. That was pretty offensive. (laughs) But not only did he say it, he did it. Get behind me, Satan. Now, obviously, Jesus wasn't talking that Peter was Satan. He was talking about the situation. That, 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 and I'll explain to him in a minute why he said those words. But what was important that I want to pull out from this verse is that he says to him, get behind me, but he does the action as well as does the verbal. He reacts in action first. You see, that is a huge lesson to us as as humans. Sometimes what you need to do is change your actions in order to do what you're declaring needs to be done. Like for instance, um, you know, psychologists again say to us again, all of these things we're finding out about humanity, which Jesus has talked about and the Bible talked about thousands of years ago, is that is is when you do when you do the action first, it will change your mindset which causes you to get out of whatever you were in. Sometimes it, changes, it needs to change the environment in order to change the mindset. Uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson, who we, we know, some of us know here real well as a clinical psychologist, he's got a book called The 12, 12 Rules of Life. And one of the first rules is get up and make your bed, make your room. What's he saying? He's saying to people, doing the smallest things, changing your habit, making your bed, cleaning your room, brushing your teeth, ironing your clothes, getting up, going to a job, doing the actions every day will pull you out of the mindset that you need to get out of. It will give you a sense of, even just a little sense of meaning and responsibility can radically change you as an individual. And so we need to action things for us. And so spiritually, what Jesus did there, He could have said, get behind me, Satan, straight to Him. But He did the action first. Why? Because it's more powerful. There's a powerful representation. For some of you, you need to get on your knees before God. Actually, literally, get on your knees before God. Because you standing up or sitting down causes you to not have the same meaning. You know, what we've done almost in Pentecostal world is thrown away all of the rituals that we saw that, that, that happened in the Catholic world or the Anglican world, and they became rituals. But they became rituals without power because they were disconnected from God. The rituals themselves aren't bad if they cause you to return towards God. There's nothing wrong with kneeling beside your bed and praying. There's nothing wrong with getting on your face before God. There's nothing wrong with getting up and walking around as you declare the goodness and the grace of God. There's nothing wrong with turning your back on situations that you need to. There are some people in your life that you need to turn your back on. Now be very wise with that. Not everyone in your life you need to turn your back on, okay? But there are some people who are pulling you down. There are some people who are speaking negativity over you. There are some people that when you get with them, you don't feel better when you leave. You feel worse. There are some situations, there are thoughts that you have that you need to turn your back on. There have been multiple situations where I've learned the art of being able to tell myself to shut up verbally to myself because the thoughts have rushed into my mind and they've tried to take me down and they've tried to cause depression or anxiety to come over me. But I've had to stop and say, shut up, George. That's not the thought from God. God does not think like that about me. He didn't create me to think like this. That's not who I am, verbally. Not trying to do it in my head, but do it verbally because faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. You know, that's why it's also important for you to read the Bible out aloud to yourself. Again, I'm not talking like you're on the train and going, "Hmm, thus saith the Lord, I have compassion on the multitude. No, you're not African-American, firstly. And secondly, talking about when you read the Bible, you read it out loud like you do 
as you're hearing me read it to you. Because faith comes by hearing the Word. That's how faith grows in our life. And so he turns his back on him and he says to him, he, I'm going to finish with this scripture. He says at the end of that scripture, for you are an offence to me, which means you are a stumbling block to me. What you're saying now is a stumbling block. Why? Because you're, mindful, you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. You're a stumbling block to me because, because what you just said, God forbid this happened to you, is actually what God is ordaining for my life, Peter, by the way, and something that I have to do. But what you're saying to me is causing me to stumble on not wanting to do it. So I'm going to turn my back on you and the situation because I have to do it. Because what you're thinking are the things of man and the natural things. I'm thinking of the spiritual things and the things of God. And I'm going to set my eyes like flint on what God has set for me to do. And whatever the circumstances are, I'm going to ignore. I'm going to do what God has called me to do and be what God has called me to be. You see, Romans, 5, Romans 8, 5 says it like this. For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit and spiritual desires. You want to know? <laughs> you want to know where your mind is set to? Look at what? is coming out of you. All of us are like this. If I'm constantly thinking about fleshly things, then all I'm doing is my heart is set towards fleshly things. But if I'm thinking about God and the things of God, then my heart is set onto the things of God. That, that's what I know, my heart is set there. That, that the first thing I do is I, I go, okay, God, what is this about? Rather than, oh, I hate this situation. Okay, Lord, Lord, what am I? Father, how do I deal with it? Holy Spirit, guide me. As opposed to, I hate, oh, look at me, always, you always, you never. And the difference between the flesh and the spirit. And there's always that tension between the flesh and the spirit. We're redeemed and we're saved and we're, we're, we're sanctified and God is great and God is good. And, and yet we still have this side to us called the flesh. That, that's why Jesus says, you are a living, or Paul says, you are a living sacrifice. Living. It would be better if we were a dead sacrifice because unfortunately a living sacrifice can try to squirm its way off the altar. The flesh starts to move a little bit, right? And so there's always that tension. I'm going to feed my spirit more than I feed my flesh because the one that gets fed the most is the one that always wins the fight. And if I feed my spirit, it'll be strong. It'll be able to tell the flesh to shush. You will not have your way over me. Amen. Why don't we close our eyes in this place and I, as I pray this prayer and give this invitation. Right now as I'm about to pray, I'm going to pray for you as we close this service in a moment. And I want to pray for you that if you don't know Jesus in this place in that personal way, as I've been speaking today and I'm talking about who Jesus is and what He has done with His disciples and the whole thing, the whole climax of these Stories that Jesus came to die for our sins, for our mistakes, even though we didn't even know we needed Him. We definitely need Him. He is our Creator and our Designer. And as humanity, we need a Saviour. That's why we search for one. We constantly yearn for one. We constantly look to see what life is about because we're designed that way in order to be able to find Jesus. And if you're in this house and you've never ask the Lord Jesus Christ to start a covenant relationship with Him where He laid down His life for us on the cross and we can lay our lives down for Him. To say, Lord, You are my God and I am Your child. And I want to walk with You. I want to know exactly who I am and what I'm meant to be and what my purpose is on this earth, why I'm here. You are the God who's got the blueprint because You designed me. While our eyes are closed in this place, I'm going to pray for you in this moment and then give you an invitation for the end of the service to be able to respond. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you that if there is any heart in this house that does not know you, maybe they're in that valley of decision right now. I pray that as this moment is happening, that you are knocking on the door of their heart, that you are speaking into their mind right now, that you are that they know that, oh man, this is me. I feel a little uneasy or I feel my heart beating a little faster. They're all signs that the Spirit of God is talking to you. He's knocking on the door of your heart and saying, 
I'm here. You've been looking for me, I'm here. And Father, for those who are in that valley of decision this day, let them know that they are loved by you, that their great, your grace and your mercy is there for them to wash them of all of their sins if they repent of all of their mistakes. That they are there, that you are there, arms wide open, ready to receive them and to shower them with your love. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen and Amen. If that's you in this place here today, then like so many others over the last couple of months who've, who've done this, and feel free, at the end of this service, there is our I Have Decided table on the right-hand side of the auditorium. Please grab a friend of yours if you've come with a friend or just uh, even on your own, have the courage to go and go to that I Have Decided table and say, hey, today I've decided that I want to follow Jesus. I've decided to, to give my life to the Lord. And, and what do I do now? How do I do this? I'd love to pray with you. They'd love to talk you through what, what the next steps are, give you a Bible, give you something called the Purple Book, which is the foundations of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus and help you on your way on what it means to walk to be a disciple of Christ. Amen. This is the greatest decision that you'll ever make. Greatest decision that you'll ever make. An eternal decision. And so today, if that's you, then please go straight after the service, straight to that desk. And you know what's been amazing is we've had quite a number of people over the last few months who've made that first time decision to do that. And so um, for those who haven't made that decision in the last few weeks, thank you so much for listening to the voice of God and for responding to Him. I know it can be a little like, I don't know what it, what it means to go to this table, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because you know what? That's what's important is you chase after God. And sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, it means having to physically do something. It means having to physically do something. And so, uh, so today, physically, at the end of the service, go to that desk. And look, if, you, if you're in that valley of decision and you don't really know yet, but I've got some questions, you can go there as well and ask, ask our pastors and leaders there. They'd love to answer your questions also. Amen? Amen. Come on, why don't we stand up? We're going to go out praising God in one moment. Um, but let me pray for you before we, we do that. For those, uh, for this week, um, to be what God's called you to be. Father, just close your eyes. Father, I thank You that as these ones go out today, these disciples of Christ who know You and walk with You right now, let them go out of this place energised, full of Your Spirit, led by You, my God, not by the flesh. And that they, they see the opportunities that You've raised with them, that You bring across their path for, you, for them to be Jesus to so many others around the world. Father, let, let more opportunities that they, than they've ever encountered happen over the coming weeks and months so that they can bring Your grace and Your love and Your care and Your mercy to those that are around them that are hurt and broken. In Jesus' Name. We all said Amen and Amen. Come on, our God's a good God. Amen. Awesome, guys. Let's go out praising Jesus. Thank you, Jimmy.